This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, Welcome to the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. And uh, some of you may see this on YouTube as well. Um, You know, if you're under the age of 25, that's the only place you consume content. (laughs) But uh, um, so I'm here with Virginia Pastrell. Uh, so she also is on Substack, but um, most of you probably know that she has done many other things. So she was the editor of Reason in uh, the 1990s, and she's written a bunch of books. Uh, we will be talking about one of her books, but um, she has also written, uh, what was it The Future and Its Enemies? That was in the 90s, right? Right. So that was the first book. I, that was the first book. I, rem- I remember you were on... Um, C-SPAN um, with uh, Brian Lamb. So I remember that. <laughs> and then Substance of, St- Substance of Style, which came out in the early 2000s. And it was uh, one thing I remember thinking is, okay, like we're all talking about the war on terror and all this stuff. And this book comes out and it's like totally different market segment. So that was, uh, it was like really stood out to me at that time. And then Power of Glamour, which was about, it's about 10 years ago, right? And then Fabric of... And fabric of civilizations, which we will we will talk to. It's how textiles made the made the world, and uh, that's a very um. It's like a, a deep dive into something that's actually super important for us. Like it's it's literally all around us, but um, I feel like we don't really talk about it that much. So this that that part is going to be interesting. Um, but first, I want to talk about um. You wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal about synthetic meat. It's titled, uh, Synthetic Meat Will Change the Ethics of Eating. And you got some interesting reactions. So just to, you know, set the stage for everybody, you know, in in case you've been sleeping for the last couple of years, there's been kind of a transformation in how we consume meat and meat substitutes in the last five years. There was the boom with, uh, you know, Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. Um, so they produce kind of like plant-based meat imitations. Uh, that boom is a little bit over, to be honest. Lately, people are kind of over it. Um, they're going back to regular meat. So we'll see how that goes. And so that's obviously like the better version of the veggie burger, where the veggie burger kind of just tastes a little different. Whereas, um, you know, with heme and other things, the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, they're trying to uh, replicate the taste, the the meaty taste and texture of uh of just regular meat, right? And um, now there's this other option, which has been around for a long time as a possibility, but um, not as a reality, uh, at least to my knowledge. Uh, but you know, Virginia, you had uh, you had sushi made out of. Um, I saw the pictures. Uh, it looked really good, actually. I like sushi. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it was salmon, and it looked really good. The shape was a little weird. Like you said, it was it was kind of like you know squarish, rounded. So yeah, first of all, uh, can you talk a little about the experience, the sensory experience? Okay, sure. Uh, so yes, I I ate uh, some uh, salmon sushi from a company in San Francisco called Wild Type. Uh, it's not yet on the market because they're still awaiting FDA approval, but they do these taste tests. And um, it, as you say, the shape is a little odd. I, I would, it's basically like the shape of a Milky Way bar. <laughs> it's, it's like partly square and partly round, but you know, no salmon comes and then they, and then they cut it. And it's, it's grown in a vat from uh, stem cells. Um that are coaxed by the environment to produce the kind of muscle that you want in sushi and even the white lines. I mean, they have it. uh, So, and it tastes normal, I guess I would say. I mean, salmon sushi isn't my favorite. Uh, It's very, very mild, uh, but it, I, I'm not a sushi connoisseur, but I couldn't tell the difference if you gave me a blind taste Mm -hmm. test. And it, one of the arguments for it is that it's actually 
it, it's pure. So it's just fish cells. It's not, you don't have to worry about anything that the fish might have picked up in the ocean, whether that's, uh, you know, bacteria, parasites, uh, microplastics, whatever it might be that you worry about. Um, and it doesn't have to be frozen. The, the, the sushi that you buy in a restaurant has been frozen uh, because that's the way they kill any contaminants, but it can potentially harm the taste. So, so it's a pretty exciting thing. And I think that the company is pretty smart to start uh, with salmon sushi because first of all, uh, sushi is, it's just been, the consumption globally has just been exploding. Uh, and the salmon stocks are difficult having a hard time keeping up even with uh, farmed salmon because salmon, even when you're farming them, quote unquote, it's very difficult because they need all different temperatures at different times in their life. Uh, so it's not as easy as having, I don't know, farm raised bass or something. I'm not sure. I'm not efficient. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so they're, uh, and, carp, and, carp, something, something like carp. Yeah, right, right. And uh, they also, um, the price point is pretty high. And the market price for uh, sushi-grade salmon is reasonably high. And that is very different from the first uh, sort of vat-grown meat, cultivated meat is the industry term, uh, that was approved by the FDA, which was for chicken. They have a much tougher uh, commercial road to hoe. <laughs> they, because chicken is super cheap. And so they're going to have to really start with, uh, you know, people who really care about chicken welfare or are worried about the, you know, the global warming effects of, of, raising meat uh, although again chicken may be not as important as beef in that regard so but this the, this is all in the context of what's going on in synthetic biology more generally which is not only about food it's about uh, alternatives to all kinds of materials leather and building materials and uh, pharmaceutical ingredients and uh, various kinds of chemical precursors to other chemicals, all being generated one way or another by taking existing, you know, uh, uh, yeast or, uh, mm. you know, all different uh, microorganisms yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. altering them so they produce what you want them to produce. Um, yeah, so yeah. I yeah, I originally got into this uh, through a company called Bolt Threads, which was doing this with spider silk, tricking, uh, you know, yeast into produce, excreting uh, silk proteins, um, which they then pivoted. And now they're doing uh, something with uh, uh, mycelium mushroom tissues to as an alternative to leather. But th there's a lot going on in this environment. And so I wrote this piece in the Wall Street Journal about uh, synthetic meat, cultivated meat, which is different, as you said at the top, from the impossible burger or, or the traditional plant burger. It is meat. It is the cells from animals. It's, they came out of an animal to begin with, and they were uh, coaxed back into the, the stem cell stage and then uh, coaxed to go to the produce the tissues that uh, are, are desired for the meat. Uh, so you're actually eating meat, you're getting the taste of the meat, uh, all of that. Um, and my argument was, aside from the fact that this is just a generally interesting phenomenon, is that this challenges the, the sort of romantic idea of what's natural is good and what's artificial is dangerous, especially dangerous for nature, dangerous for the planet, uh, because now there are people who are using these highly artificial, very technological scientific techniques uh, to harness nature in ways that they argue are better for nature, better for the planet. Uh, so it kind of upsets the the categories a lot. The kind of people who mm -hmm. eat natural foods, so-called, are both the audience and the enemies <laughs> of this potential. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, I want to I wanna take a, like a step back when you're talking about synthetic biology. I think people can think uh, or might think, oh, well, this is very 21st century. Uh, so it's been around for a while. You kind of alluded to some of the things that synthetic biology has done. So uh, I just want to point out one of the biggest ones, um, the biotech country, co- company Genentech. Uh, it made a lot of its money early on uh, by uh, producing synthetic human insulin which yeah, obviously right. revolution revolutionized the lives of diabetics because you know the constraint and supply all of a sudden uh, was transformed right what's really going on now synthetic biology has been used a lot in pharmaceuticals that's that was its early applications because of the the sort of amounts you need and the prices you can get work out better at an earlier stage of development now the the technology has sort of marched on and the prices are coming down and the quantities produced for a given input are going up. And so people are starting to apply it beyond pharmaceuticals, although still a lot in pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical ingredients. Yeah. And no one, uh, I mean, at least actually, I think it was called, I think they called it Humulin at first. And I do remember reading in some of the textbooks that initially people were, quote, creeped out by it because it was produced in bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. But um, one thing, and this is not synthetic biology, one thing I would, you know, I always tell people is read the articles about test tube babies in the New York Times in the 1980s, oh, yeah. you know, because you, you can read the archives and they are really freaked out. And now, yeah. you know, I have friends, you know, I have friends who are test tube babies, whatever. Right, they don't, sure. We don't call them they're that. Walk, they're they're just, walking amongst yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they're on my podcast and stuff like that. I don't I don't even say it. It's not even notable in their biography, you know. So um, a lot of this stuff, I don't want to say it's always like this, but a lot of the stuff that we think is weird, we're going to get used to it. Um, and so with this, though, um, so, you know, I thought it was a fine article. Uh, you know, I read the Wall Street Journal article, and you actually sent me like a somewhat longer version. But in any case, yeah. you know, it gets the gist of it. But the reaction. Um, so we've been talking a little bit about the science, and maybe we want to go back to a little bit because I think there's there's a lot there. Um, I, I myself am pretty. Like, look, I think this is like the classic Bill Gates thing where he said in the 1990s, we tend to overestimate the impact of new technologies in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. So I actually still think that, uh, you know, plant based meats, uh, this sort of like cellular stuff will transform uh, the landscape of production and consumption. And I I, I do think that there, there will still be a demand for real meat at the higher end, particularly with like highly structured uh, things like ribeye steak. OK, like maybe you could someday produce a ribeye right, steak yeah. artificially, but it might be you need a lot of movement and you might as well just use a cow. You know, yeah. I mean, you could create it. You could create an artificial scaffold for the meat and have it run around. But basically, that's a cow. Right. So I'm not joking here. That's kind of the thing you would need to do. Yeah. Right, you know, right, yeah. you'd have to produce an exoskeleton. But in any case, but you got a really strange react or like, you know, you got a particular reaction. So obviously we're imagining some people are imagining, you know, crunchy people that are eating granola that wear Birkenstocks. They're freaked out. OK, I mean, that makes sense. They probably are freaked out, actually. But then there was also another segment. And can, can you talk about that? Yeah. So uh, the wall of the I first noticed in the Wall Street Journal commenters who skew to the right. um, And they were very, many of them were extremely hostile and very, um, uh, very personally threatened almost seeming um, as though somebody was going to come in and, you know, steal the steak off their plate. Uh, Because I did make the point that over time, this could change our sense of what is ethical in terms of eating. Uh, because ethics do evolve, uh, you know, some things are considered unethical in, in pretty much all circumstances, but other kinds of ethics evolve, uh, you know, for forever, it was perfectly fine for children to work. Now we think it's horrible. And that's because we, it's both more valuable and you know, we, we're rich enough to send them to school instead. You know, um, and so eating meat might be one of those things. But people were very hostile, and the reaction was very much, uh, which got to be more after it was picked up uh, uh, on Instapundent's blog, and uh, the comments there were much nastier than the Wall Street Journal comments. And people very much saw it not as 
oh, this is an interesting new technology. Aren't people clever? Let's see what happens in the marketplace. The kind of traditional, if you will, uh, right of center reaction to a new development in the marketplace. They saw it, no, as part of the culture war, that this was an attack on people who eat meat and it was going to be uh, ultimately imposed at, at some point there would come a time when uh, they would be uh, you know banning uh, traditional meats and that time is not like 50 years from now the idea is that it was going to be relatively soon mm-hmm. uh, and I understand where that comes from uh, because as we recently had the flap over gas stoves, I mean, there is this banning impulse, and especially if you can tie anything to climate change, and some of this is, some of the motivation for some of this research and development is because the idea is that you could reduce emissions uh, in the production of, of, of meat um, and other, other things. But I I think it's, it was a little knee jerk. Uh, it, it was a little like uh, an autoimmune reaction. That is to say, yes, sometimes there really is a threat to you, uh, but sometimes your body just attacks things that aren't there. And I, I, I mm-hmm. felt like this was more of, of that example. But I think that the people who are in this business need to think about that because many of them are within very sheltered cultural environments themselves and so they're worried about being yeah. attacked by the vegans uh but <laughs> yeah yeah but they're, they're, you're saying they're in a bubble i mean you know I, I i'm in the scientific milieu and you know the yeah there, there's definitely like the distribution of ideologies is not uh a, a representation of the broader public so sometimes they get a little confused about what's going on out there right um so i think um when I read the reaction, um, there was a, a particular meme that I thought of, which is, I will not live in a pod and I will not eat the bugs. And I think like, <laughs> yeah. that's where the that's where the reaction is kind of coming from, because they feel like these people, whoever these people are, they have an engineered future. And this is part of the this artificial, this fa- Franken meat, you know, as, as people would. I mean, it's not G- genetically modified organisms, but the same you know, wisdom of repugnance is, is I think, coming to the fore there, right? Right. Well, I, I actually don't think that it's the wisdom of repugnance for the most part. I think it's the hatred of elites. Um, I think it's the idea that people who are in, you know, venture backed companies in the Bay area or Boston are them and they're going to be attacking us. And uh, so I don't really think that it is about it, that it's another example of the, uh, the test tube baby phenomenon, which was okay. definitely the wisdom of repugnance or even the eating bugs thing, because it's like, it's meat people. It's meat. It just comes out of a different way. It's not, you don't have to eat bugs. It's an alternative to eating bugs. You know? Yeah. Um, but, um, okay. Yeah. So, so basically, basically, uh, so what you're getting at there is there is probably going to be a, a, a reaction on the cultural left, quote unquote, uh, which is going to be based on, Oh, this is artificial, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, where and that, where I, yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. And the people in the industry are highly aware and attuned to that reaction. Uh, because those people go after them all the time. And they often know those people <laughs> or or are, are sort of adjacent to those people. And so they're they're very careful about how they address those concerns, even though they know they can't win everybody over. Uh, they're less conscious, I think, of this sort of right wing, for lack of a better term, populist. It's really populist. Uh, it might take a left. It, who who knows how the people would identify? But th- this idea that people who have values different from yours are going to impose their consumer choices on you. Yeah, and so I, I guess this gets at you know what you alluded to um, the change on the 
right, um, the American right, the conservative side, although, you know, that includes libertarians like you, obviously, um, traditionally, like, I don't know how you where you know, a lot of people, yeah, right. they've changed a lot in the last, you know, yeah. like, let's talk about, right. we're not going to talk about people like Grant Greenwald. I don't know where he is. Right. So it's really hard to say, but you know, traditionally, yeah, traditionally, you know, there was a libertarian element in the conservative party, the three legged stool with, uh, you know, you know, foreign affairs in terms of like, you know, strong defense. Then you have like small government, more libertarian and social conservative. And things have gotten really, at least rhetorically over the last five to six years. And, um, you know, sometimes Tucker Carlson will praise Liz Warren and she's not super excited about it. But, you know, that's there. Then there's like Compact Magazine. You know, there's just weird stuff out there. And like, how do you feel as someone who's been writing, commenting and you were at Reason. So you were you know kind of in that whole, and I know you've talked about the fact that, um, you know, you're not a traditional conservative and you're obviously not a liberal or a traditional liberal. And so it's like, you don't fit into the different, uh, boxes. So it's not like they're going to have you as a talking head to give, you know, your two cents. But I mean, how do you feel things have changed around you or do you feel like, okay, well, I'm a libertarian and like the world is what it is. I've always been an oddball. Well, uh, well, I've always been an oddball. That's for sure. Um, I haven't, I, regardless of what my politics have been, um, but I, I was a 12 year old McGovernite in South Carolina, but um, the, I describe myself for lack of a better term as a classical liberal. Um, I feel much more affinity for Adam Smith than for Murray Rothbard, who I feel no affinity for, <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think what's happened is that, libertarianism which is itself you know small but it had multiple elements in it uh, which you can divide in different ways there was always a very intellectual side of it and then there was a popular grassroots side that was just kind of get out of my face um and so those two sides, to some extent, have split from each other. The other thing is, if you go back to um, David Hackett Fisher's much quoted book, Albion Seed, about American folkways, the British folkways in North America, and he talks about different ideas of liberty, and he has four, but I'm only going to talk about two of them. Uh, he has the... Um, the natural liberty, which is associated with the Scotch-Irish, the, the sort of the largest group of uh, settlers from Brit the British Isles, and then and sort of in the in the southern in Appalachia, that kind of thing. And then he talks about reciprocal liberty uh, associated with the Quakers and in, in Pennsylvania. And reciprocal liberty is I respect your liberty, you respect mine, because we see each other all uh, uh, in the Quaker tradition as both children of God. Natural liberty is basically get out of my face. Uh, and it also has a very clannish element. And in I believe that the American libertarian movement, especially in its less intellectual form. So we're not talking about Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, people like that, but we're talking about, you know, Joe Reason Reader or even Joe Reason Editor um, as was a fusion of those two traditions. And they need each other because without the reciprocal liberty, the natural liberty becomes too clannish and exclusive. And without the natural liberty, the reciprocal liberty becomes too weak. But what's happened is they've split, too. And so what you see a lot is like if somebody tells you a, you're, they're a libertarian nowadays, you don't know anything about them, actually. <laughs> you don't know if they are really a sort of conspiracy-oriented MAGA person or they are, a, you know, a cosmopolitan um intellectual type who is very concerned about black lives matter i mean you don't know anything yeah about yeah, them, yeah. So, so, so uh, they, they could be someone who has someone who has coffee with matt iglesias at the niskanen center yeah right exactly um and so they uh, um you and so it's become in my opinion 
a virtually meaningless term, except insofar as it sort of describes sociologically people who cluster around certain things like Reason Magazine, but um, or the Cato Institute, or you know these institutions. But but what it means in terms of content is all over the map, just like what liberal and conservative means. So, so our categories have been kind of upended. However, the categories in the future and its enemies, still more or less true. Uh, yeah, actually, do you want to, you want to, you want to talk about like the dynamists and the stasis? Yes. Do you want to so talk I'm a little not, bit about yeah, that? I don't want to go into a, a lot, uh, but yeah. So back in 98, I published this book, The Future and Its Enemies. Uh, and it posited that to understand uh, the cultural and political landscape, rather than dividing it into the traditional left and right, uh, it was better to think about it in terms of dynamism versus stasis. Dynamism being a kind of bottom-up order created through competition and feedback, whether that's in the economy, obviously being the leading example, but it could also be science, it could be religion, uh, it could be culture. Uh, you have people saying, well, I don't like the way things are. Let me ch tr you know, change this. And we see whether it works or not. And that was kind of the dynamist approach. And then the stasis approach uh, uh, values either stability or control. And I kind of split them into two where you had people who want things to stay the same or often to go back to the past and stay like some imagined past. And I called them reactionaries. And then you also have people who value a controlled future. So they're like, oh, yes, I'm all for the future, but it has to look exactly like this. And they tend to be very highly regulatory and uh, very technocratic. I call them technocrats. Uh, so that was the idea of the future and its enemies, which came out in 98 when I think it was very true. Then because of the aftermath of 9-11, uh, it kind of lost relevance, I would say, because it really wasn't about thinking about foreign affairs at all. Um, but it has come back in a big way now uh, because it it is it speaks to a lot of the divisions that we see today and some of the things that seem peculiar, uh, where you have, as you said, Tucker Carlson praising uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, which is a sort of classic stasis move. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk now about dynamism, kind of, I guess, or more Adam Smith related things, because uh, textiles obviously are a big part of uh, in terms of like early modern economics. But like, let's 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 move it really far back to the kind of stuff that I think about a lot. Um, so fabric of civilization, uh, you know, it's it covers a lot of different topics and, uh, you know, big time scale. Um, so like, let's go back 50,000 years, um, fiber, and then you can jump forward to the Neolithic if you want. But I, I want to ask you about like, what do we know, um, in more detail about, uh, just early modern humans, Neanderthals and like, you know, cause I don't know much about it, but I do know, um, that people have, or I've read people claim that, um, early modern humans, our lineage from Africa, 50, 60,000 years ago had better clothes somehow and i don't know how that works uh just because like we we push further into siberia than the neanderthals like we push further north and so um in terms of like needles and sewing and stuff like that do you know anything yeah. about that so why don't you um, just why don't you just okay. like you know say, this okay, year, yeah. so let me start with the fabric of civilization which does not cover leather and skins and when you're talking about moving into siberia that's what you're covering so uh those things are sometimes considered textiles but you know, I couldn't write about everything and I didn't write about that. But one of the amazing things that happened was between the time that I submitted the manuscript at the end of 2019 and I don't know, maybe two months later uh, when I did the revised version is the earliest string moved back in time, the published you know, research on the early history, moved back in time 20,000 years, from 30,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. So their string is not textiles. 
string is a much earlier technology and it is an extremely powerful technology because once you have figured out how to make a string, you can do all kinds of things. You can make fishing nets, you can tie your food up off the ground, you can carry babies, you can, uh, you can, um, tie your spearheads to your arrows or your spears, uh, it's very versatile. It's a general purpose technology. And uh, so the way you make string is you take some type of fiber, the earliest seem to be from plants, and you you twist it so that it becomes longer and stronger. So you, you and and then you might take two of those twists and twist them together, which is called plying. And these archaeologists in France uh, identified very clearly, I mean, I've seen the pictures, uh, Neanderthal string from 50 years ago, uh, 50,000 years ago. It is clearly made by people. It is not something you would find, you know, it's not some random vine. It has been twisted and it has been plied and it's tiny. I mean, the remnants of it on a tool, uh, but it's good enough. And, and so we know that 50,000 years ago, uh, Neanderthals were making string and probably modern humans were, you know, later as, uh, as well uh, as early technology. It's very, one of the challenges about talking about textiles or talking about string is that you know, it, there's a lot less of it than there is of stone or pottery, ceramics, because things rot. So there are only a few places in the world that you can find, uh, the remnants of it, but that's the earliest uh, string. It takes a long time before you go from string to textiles or from thread. You can think of this. Uh, the yeah. Early, the earliest textiles that have been found, and again, they're not the earliest that were made, but are from about nine thousand years ago from a cave in Israel in the desert. So, and, and they're. And they're sophisticated. So clearly this was not somebody, this is not the first textile ever made. This yeah. is, you know, the, uh, it was a well-practiced craft by then. Uh, so one argument, which not everybody agrees with, but uh, from a guy named Ian Gilligan, who's an Australian, uh, is that what happened was during the Ice Ages, you got... Uh, what he calls complex clothing. That is, this goes back to your think about the farther into the, the farther north. Uh, people learned how to make not just wrap a hide around themselves, but sew it so that it was cut and cut it so that it could be close to the body and could serve warmth better. Then the glaciers receded, and suddenly those complex gar garments are kind of hot and sweaty and not so good for you. And yet people have been wearing clothes for, you know, 10,000 years or some, some really long period of time. And modesty norms have developed. Um, so instead of just going back to running around naked, essentially they invent textiles. I mean, it's, it's obviously there are some gaps to be filled in. And in order to have textiles, they develop agriculture. Because uh, to make textiles, you need a lot of fiber. You need a lot more than you need just to make some useful string. Um, and so you need to grow flax to make linen, or you need to raise sheep to have wool. Uh, and then you start to biologically alter these things so that you get more of what you need. Uh, and, and you can see that, archaeologists can see that in the... Uh, the record the material record so uh so israel is the first record um but i mean presumably you know the neolithic happened in other places a little bit later but yeah, uh, yeah there's also so, some very old uh, uh there's something in turkey where there's an imprint on a pot or something that uh, but yeah and, so and, i mean uh, one thing yeah so one thing with one thing with textiles that I, I will say um, is uh, um, they're harder to, uh, like, unlike pots, they don't stay preserved. And so this is why I think, because I, I tried to like look at um, the the literature. I mean, I don't, I'm not an archaeologist, so, you know, obviously whatever, but um, it was a lot, 
I don't want to say speculative, but they didn't just didn't have a lot to work with compared to other aspects. Well, I mean, pots or or like some sort of like, um, you know, stone axe or something like that. Those things last a really, really long time. It seems textiles. Yeah. I mean, look, I know this personally. Um, uh Anyway, so I, I have some experience with antique quilts. That's all I'll say. Yeah, and like, okay. they, like after, a, after a couple of hundred years, like sometimes they're ma, you know, it's like a couple of hundred. Yeah, and yeah, these are things yeah. that are in closets. They're not like out in the world. Yeah. So the places where archaeologists find uh, actual textiles uh, remaining tend to be, most of them are in deserts. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there, there's some places in Israel uh, there's some places in in Turkey. Uh, there's some places in Peru. The oldest uh, dyed textile that's been found, which is uh, 6,200 years old, is from Peru, uh, which also was one of the early places to cultivate cotton. Um, and, and these are all dry, very dry places. Egypt, obviously, but the Egypt, the Egyptian textiles aren't as old as some of these other ones. Um, there are also some bogs in Europe where textile have textiles have been found but again not as old uh, but you know old enough to keep um, and the other thing is for a long time our most archaeologists didn't think about textiles and as a result they would often clean finds in ways that removed traces of textiles so nowadays a lot a textile archaeologist look at things like mineralization, uh, where something used to be covered with a textile. The textile is gone, but you can still see the imprint or, or the the pattern of the textile. And and if you have a microscope, you can see which way the thread was twisted. And, and <laughs> this is detail I did not get into in the book because it is mind-numbingly mm -hmm. <laughs> technical, but they talk about Z oh, yeah. twist yeah. and Z twist, and then you can see, you know, are things made in the same area or do they travel? Things like that. Uh, there are some places in Africa that are uh, kind of in, the, oh, in Sudan and places like that where there's some older textiles. Uh, but but and, and there are places in the Tiring Basin in China where there are very old mummies that have been discovered. But again, they're not 9,000 years old. They're yeah. 5,000, know, 5, something like that. So, so yeah, you're yeah. not talking – Neolithic is not a category where we have you know, textiles sticking around or even mm -hmm. string. Yeah, yeah, they're they're beyond. I mean, when you're talking about material, you know, it's like well, like for example, with DNA, uh, the the inner ear that they're getting the ancient DNA from, there's like exponent, there's an exponential, you know, decay, and that is based on like where in the body it is, the temperature, and all these sorts of things. Obviously, something like a pot or you know that also decays, right. but that's a much flatter decay. Textiles, obviously, I mean, it's like soft tissue decays much faster than. Obviously, right. mineralized right. bone and subfossil, right. right. and so you know when when you're talking about material culture, you're just going to have a different distribution of um, right. just your right. sample as you go into the go into the past. And there are archaeobotanists who look at trying to figure out, you know, th they tend to be emphasizing food crops, but along the way, they also look at what textile crops might have been grown, or you know, what was the flax being used for, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, just a random question because I don't remember reading it in the book. Is do you know if textiles, uh, tex like you know something like flax is or cotton later is part of the secondary products revolution? Like, do you know if it's it's categorized as that? Have you heard of that? It's it's kind of controversial. Is my under I don't know this in a deep way, um, but because I'm I'm you know this is really but. There are some people, I, I think traditionally it has been considered to be, uh, but there are some people who think, no, it actually came earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like if, so, if, so if the listeners or the viewer, if you guys want to dig into the literature, there are people who claim, as Virginia just said, like, you know, there's ice, you know, we don't know. We don't know yet. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll discover like new ways of archaeological investigation. You know, I mean, it's been known to happen. So, um, but right now, so at that stage, it's um, pretty speculative. But there's a less speculative part, which uh, you know, as a geneticist, I was 
you know, obviously paid attention to this part of the book, uh, the cotton, <laughs> cotton genetics. Yes. So, that's, <laughs> so that's the best. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I, so the genetics of cotton are so weird and interesting. Um, first of all, mo- there, there are about 50 species of cotton, of, of gasipium is the uh, category, uh, in the world. And most of them have no more fiber than a peach. Uh, they have these hibiscus-like flowers, but they're just, you know, they just produce seeds. There was one mutation uh, somewhere in Africa, and there's some dispute over exactly where, uh, that produced this fiber, these fiber-coated seeds, uh, for reasons that nobody understands, because it's not clear I mean, it's not clear why it survived. It doesn't, there's no obvious advantage to it before human beings show up to cultivate it, but, but it did. And not only did it survive, but some, somehow some of this cotton from Africa, which they call that the A genome, got over to the Yucatan Peninsula in what is now Mexico and crossbred with one of these no fiber local cottons and produced a new form of cotton that has twice as much genetic material. Polyploidy is common in the plant kingdom. Um, And as a result of that, when human beings showed up and started cultivating cotton, there were there were sort of more variables to fool around with, not that they knew that this was what was going on. So that uh, the, the, there were two kinds of cotton that were cultivated in the New World, uh, Gisipium uh, barbadense, which is it was on, in, on, in Peru, which is the long fibered cotton, sometimes called Sea Island cotton, sometimes miscalled Egyptian cotton, um, Pima cotton. And there was uh, Gisipium hirsutum, which is 90% of the cotton in the world, which came from the Yucatan. Then there were two kinds that were cultivated in the old world, one in in Africa, again, they don't really know where, and one in the Indus Valley. And so those are the, there were these four big cotton raising regions uh, that started out. And so then when Europeans came to the Americas, they saw this cotton and they knew exactly what it was because they were familiar with it. Uh, but that cotton eventually took over the world because it was better because of this genetic quality. But What's really interesting is uh, um, is that there used to be two theories of how the cotton got from Africa to the Yucatan. One was, oh, well, it must have been back before, you know, when the tectonic plates were closer together and it could just sort of travel over land. And the other was, well, humans must have brought it in boats. But when once it became possible to sort of clock it genetically it turns out no it's not from when dinosaurs roamed the earth and it's way before human beings so you know there must have been a hurricane or something some weird event happened to get it over there but yeah it's it's a fascinating story yeah so um cotton i mean one of the um, one of the cool things about I mean, cotton's cool, you know, like, you know, I've seen the when I used to watch TV, there's the like, fabric of our lives commercials. So it has oh, a lot yeah, of good right. uh, ad- advertising. But um, the Aztecs, uh, they had cotton armor. So, oh, <laughs> I yeah, mean, yeah. I, like, yeah, they layered it up. It's like very versatile. Yeah, 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 yeah no. The, uh, and the Incas as well. They did sort of padded uh, cotton armor which you know is maybe as good as metal but it has some advantages <laughs> oh. all right so you know we've been talking like about specific things uh virginia like you know there's a lot of you know topics you touched on in the book and like textiles is a i mean like this is it's a discipline you know um there's like a lot of scholarship about it um and there's different types of textiles. we just talked about cotton we're talking about linens from flax uh there's also wool right um right. And stuff like that. So, can you just like give us a general? And like we today, we have synthetics. You know, right. uh, you know, you know, in the nineteen seventies or whatever, there was like all over the place. And so, can you just like give us a quick survey of like how things? So, for example, um, my understanding or impression is like wool was a big deal in Europe, um, but you know, obviously, I, I would say wool is more of a specialty 
at this point because like if you wear yeah, woolen yeah, things yeah. you know yeah, wool so can you just about, like yeah 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 nowadays wool has about two percent of the market but okay so traditionally i would say there were five big fibers wool cotton linen silk and hemp silk being at the top of the market and hemp being at the bottom of the market um and cotton eventually displaced hemp so no it was not a conspiracy about marijuana it was cotton was I, okay I, I've, I've heard about i've I've heard about this at a lot of parties. A lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cotton cotton displaced hemp before any of that. Hemp was really, nowadays they have ways of treating hemp, it's, which is actually called cottonizing them. And, and it's a much nicer fiber. But, but traditional hemp was peasant fabric, just as silk was the highest of the high. Um, and silk developed originally in China, spread east and spread west. Um, uh, as far, I mean, the ancient Romans knew about it. So it spread pretty far, uh, West and of course spread to Japan where they're also developed a big silk industry. And so, um, there were, because these were agricultural products, they tended to be in specific areas. So wool was the big European and the further north you went, the more dominant it was. Although Europeans tended to wear linen undergarments, which could be more mm -hmm. easily laundered and also are a little bit more comfortable next to the skin. Well, I mean, uh, undergarments are sometimes called linens, right? I mean, I, I don't know. That, that's, and, that's the way well, I know it. Well, more commonly, sheets are called linens. But yes, it, if yeah, you go yeah. back, if you're reading something from like the 18th century and they refer to linens, they're probably talking about, or or okay. often they'll just call it linen and they mean underclothes. Um, in, in, in North Africa, it was sort of linen territory with some cotton. Farther south in Africa, it, it tends to be predominantly cotton. Um, Asia, you get cotton at least through the subcontinent and then in like china it tends to be more silk and hemp where people are cultivating silk in large quantities and they're taxed in silk uh, but often they're wearing hemp uh, so yeah yeah i mean it's affordable right okay yeah. so you have like the these different geographical patterns and i know you know you already alluded to this i think like uh, augustus introduced sumptuary laws uh specifically because like the massive species uh basically like romans loved wearing silk they couldn't get it from anywhere but the east and you know so like like and the wool was also a big deal for the english in terms of their economic growth right in terms of like oh, yeah. uh, well, illustrate well, yeah yeah, so wool was very important for the English. Um, they, in the sort of early modern period and even the Middle Ages, and they would they would make wool and cloth and they would export it to Italy, where primarily other places too, but simplifying. Export it to Italy where it'd be finished and dyed and turned into very, you know, very luxurious clothes in many cases. Um, and there was, you know, trade develops in textiles in Europe it's one of the earliest traded goods um, within Europe, and lots of institutions come out of that. Lots of financial institutions and uh, methods of communication, uh, uh, all of that sort of thing. Um, but you also have, you know, once once the Americas come into play, you've got. And 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 Europeans are going to around Africa to India. Then you start getting Indian cottons into Europe and even into the Americas, and that's a huge revolution uh, because not only are is the cotton cloth really nice, and especially at the very high end, really lightweight muslins that you know can't even be made today, um, but the dyeing is amazing because people in India mastered how to, cotton is hard to dye. I have dyed cotton. It is hard to mm -hmm. dye with traditional plant-based dyes or, or animal-based dyes. Um, Indians mastered how to get it, to, not only to dye and to dye a lot of different colors, but how to get it to be color fast and not fade in the wash. And also they had all these printing technologies that were 
were new to Europeans as well, because Europeans did not, wool isn't, doesn't lend itself to printing and linen is even harder to dye than cotton. Mm. So Europeans, they would have checks and plaids and things like that. That was patterns uh, that were created on the loom, but they didn't print. So that was a big revolution and uh, um, influenced all kinds of, you know, it, it influences the European colonialism. It influences the development of the industrial revolution, trying to figure out how to spin cotton uh, with machines since you can't do it as well as Indian ladies uh, using, doing it by hand. Um, at, so all of this you know, has massive ramifications down the line. And then, oh, and yeah. go back to your rich. And then in the early 20th century, you start to get what are called artificial fibers, which is basically like rayon. It's taking something natural, in that case, wood, and turning it into a, like, not chemically dissolving it and turning it into a fiber. And then in the 30s, you get actually synthetic fibers where people are making polymers in the lab, the first one being nylon. And and then you know polyester and all of those kinds of things and that's a big revolution so i um yeah i'm gonna jump ahead we have <laughs> there's a bunch of yeah, questions i know we're running out of time. I knew this yeah time. but 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 i, I want to ask about um like you know your take on like synthetics because i you know I, I i'm i'm old enough uh to kind of remember the tail end of when i mean look synthetics are still around um but i'm I feel like there was a period when they were bigger and they kind of became kind of unfashionable and people went more natural cotton. And I mean, do you have like a general take on that that you could like, you know, yeah, it's actually know, interesting. I've actually, I've actually written an article about this, uh, which is on works and co, which I'm now uh, working for um, as a contributing editor, but, and it's, awesome. it's about po polyester because actually synthetics are incredibly common now. What happened is, you are right, there was this period in the 70s where they were very, very big. It starts in the 60s, but, you know, it's this miracle fabric. It's easy to wash and dry, um, easy care, and uh, took over everything, and it was relatively cheap. And then a bunch of things happened at once. Uh, people started to notice that after a night of disco dancing, this outfit stinks and I can't get the smell out of it. And the price of oil went way up. And so it became less, you know, less affordable and styles change. And then in the eighties, you have this backlash, early eighties, uh, backlash where uh, people turn away from synthetics and especially from polyester and say, no, we're only going to wear natural fibers, and you have a resurgence of cotton in particular, uh, because cotton is by far the most popular of the, you know, plant-based mm -hmm. or the non-synthetic fibers. But then what happened is that people started to figure out how to turn polyester into a performance fabric. Uh, with the development of fleece and the development of microfibers that could be, whose shapes could be altered in such a way as to have very specific performance characteristics like wicking. And so now if you go and you buy athletic apparel or outdoor apparel, it's almost all synthetic. It's almost all polyester that's been manipulated yep. in ways to give it these characteristics. Um, uh, so that's really changed. And, and, and the result has been polyester is by now by far the most popular, uh, you know, the biggest sales of any, uh, any of textile in the world. And it's practically free. That's the other thing. It's like really cheap. Wait, uh, so Wait, I mean, so, I mean, you're talking about like athleisure and, you know, yeah, like workout, all, all, workout all clothes. Of, all, yeah. yeah, all of that stuff. But then the techniques for making it more wearable that started in this sort of drive for performance. So you were making clothes for mountain climbers and athletes and, you know, runners and people like that. But then it, it filtered down into making polyester a, a more desirable fabric. I mean, people 
liking the way it felt again. So I have polyester sheets. Um, not all my sheets mm-hmm. are polyester, but I never would have thought of, of that once upon a time. Uh, but they're they're mm-hmm. comfortable. And now, so now the problem is, oh, we have so much polyester, you know, it has environmental impacts. And so now the focus of research in that industry is, I mean, there's still a lot of performance research, but a lot of it is on how do we make it so it doesn't shed microfibers or how do we make it so that it can be recycled. Um, the collection issues are tremendous when you're dealing with textiles as opposed to like plastic bottles. But uh, yeah, so that's that's been a very interesting arc. And if people want to read it, uh, read about it, they can go on worksinprogress.co. Mm. Yeah, works in progress is great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna. There's there's a last question I want to ask you. And I want to talk about real quick. Um, so, you know, there's the slow food movement. Um, there's people that make everything from scratch, and you know, I've done a little of this. You know, it's like whatever. It's it's kind of it's meditative. Okay, like food related. You know, when it comes right. to food. Uh, but one thing, I mean, you point out in the book, and like I think most people, when they think about it, like go back to say the Odyssey and what Penelope was doing, like, literally the queen of Ithaca, or you know, right. the highest status woman of it, like, working on looms, um, you know, producing textiles, like household production was ubiquitous in the pre-modern world. Uh, right. People spent a lot of their time making textiles, repairing textiles. Uh, they didn't just go to the Gap, you know. Um, so there's this whole idea, uh, we don't know where our food comes from, you know, uh, but you know, I started, as I was reading the book, um, oh, well, I read the book in the past and I went back and reread sections just to re-familiarize. Um, uh, but in any case, um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I know there, you know, so I, and I mentioned this before we were recording, I think he'll be okay with me telling people this. My eight year old son is a big weaver. Um, he also knits, but, uh, he weaves and knits. And, um, you know, he's, he's placed in fairs and stuff. He's super into it. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's great for him, but anyway, it, it's doable. People still do it, but I don't feel that it's, I mean, there are knitting circles and whatnot, but I don't feel like it's a massive, massive cultural thing. And, um, do you think, do you think people have a strong consciousness of it? Cause partly, um, you would, if you read it, if you read older literature or, um, epics or whatever, it's there. But a lot of people don't anymore, and I feel like they're not as conscious of how much labor went into producing textiles. You know, right? Well, that's yeah, that's definitely true. And the 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 top line stat that I always give is if you look at the fabric it takes to make a typical pair of blue jeans, that requires about six miles of cotton yarn or thread to weave the fabric. And before the Industrial Revolution, the fastest, best weavers in the, I mean, the best spinners in the world who were in India using the charka, um, they would have taken about, one of those would have taken about 100 hours to just to spin the thread. That's before you weave it. That's before you dye it. That's before you sew it. And that also doesn't include the period where you're preparing the fiber, you know, ginning it, making it nice, cleaning it, all that stuff. So a hundred hours for one pair of jeans. And that's the fastest, best spinners in the world before the industrial revolution. Um, if you take the, the, the Viking techniques of, of spinning, it's not entirely comparable because they were spinning wool, which is actually easier to spin, but they would have taken twice as long to spin that much fiber. So uh, that's the world before spinning machines and the Industrial Revolution. And then even after the Industrial Revolution, you have a generation where you don't have power looms. So the looms, the weaving still takes a long time. And then all the way up to, you know, in the 1970s, when I was a teenager, people, most women in particular, still knew how to sew. Uh, that's much rarer today. And basically quilting hobbyists have kept that whole industry of, you know, making sewing machines, et cetera, alive. Uh, So we live in a world where textile, we have textile abundance and that's great. And that's definitely progress, but it also makes us not think about where they come from and how much, you know, knowledge and ingenuity is embedded in them. Now I do know people who, you know, 
can do it all. <laughs> Raise the sheep, spin the wool, weave the wool, dye the wool. Uh, and that's because in the process of doing the book, I got involved in the hand weaving guild here in LA. And and while the guild is specifically devoted to weaving in various forms, and most people buy commercial yarns, um, some of the people do enjoy spinning because it's meditative once you get good at it, and et cetera. But, but it's still very slow. They're still buying their, clo- their clothes you know, off the rack. Yeah. So you just mentioned... Um... Wow. You know, I, I did know that people were sewing into the 70s. And I know this just, uh, well, I mean, I'll just say it. like my mother-in-law had a business in the 1970s uh, making swimsuits. It was like a side thing. Wow. And sh- she was basically, you know, she stopped doing it because it was, she couldn't compete. Um, right. And now that you're saying that, I'm like, yeah. So there's been this massive transformation in the last, you know, 40 to 50 years. That's what it sounds like in terms of like the per unit cost. And yeah. Yeah. So in the seventies, it was cheaper to make your own clothes than to buy them. Now it's cheaper to buy them. And the only reason to make them is like, you really like sewing or you want to make something that you can't find. Um, And that's why quilting is the main form of sewing nowadays, as opposed to making clothes. So uh, this this part of our conversation, I'm actually like kind of like taken aback because we talk about things like fracking that have transformed energy production or solar power. And, you know, like, you know, I, I read the Wall Street Journal, you know, I read, you know, science and tech magazines and I've read histories of like oil distribute and all this stuff. But actually what you're just saying, it's like, you know, this is a really big deal. And I feel like people like me, like regular people, we don't think about it we don't think about the because this is like a massive transformation in terms of what you just said in terms of the cost like in terms of like our labor value and everything like that and we just kind of take it for granted you know also like part of it is driven by globalization right like my family is from bangladesh and you know that's totally transformed that country yeah it's all driven by globalization i'm telling you because i grew up in the in south carolina in the place where you could go to the place that you know, made the textiles or made the clothes, that was the outlet. They would actually, it would actually like be at the factory. So I could get clothes like as cheap as anyone in the U S could get clothes pretty much. And they were very expensive by today's standards. Um. Yeah. So it's a, so I guess, you know, um, I mean, we do live in a world of plentitude. Um, I feel like right now there is in the United States kind of, um, Despite the fact that we're still we're the richest we've ever been, I have a supercomputer in my pocket all the time. Um, my my youngest, uh, I have told this story before. My youngest child, he's five. He cannot use a phone because he's really creeped out about not seeing a face. <laughs> well, so. <laughs> I think I I mean I think that is actually normal. I think that I I mean I, re- I remember long before anybody had more than a science fictional idea of seeing faces on the phone, that being on the phone was really weird and creepy. I mean, so I think (laughs) we just used to get used to it. Um, And so that your kid's reaction is the normal human reaction. (laughs) That's uh, a reflex, yeah. To to a disembodied (laughs) voice. It's just that people got used to it. Um, but you know, it was very intimidating to call somebody on the phone, uh, <laughs> or, or whatever. And, and of course we used to call people blind much more than we do now. Now we say, Oh, I'd like to, t-, you know, we send an email or a text and say, you know, can, can we call and you don't just yes. dial somebody up. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, so I mean, we live in a dynamic time. It's exciting times. It's interesting times. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed this conversation because I'm just like, thinking about it. it's really positive. I mean, you know, it's just really positive that we have all these cheap clothes because I do not want to spend my day on the loom <laughs> or uh, my wife certainly does not. Um, so um, that, that's great. Um, so Virginia, it's been great talking to you. Um, so you do have a sub stack and I'll link to that. 
And uh, I guess you're at Works of Progress. You also have a fellowship. Uh, is it Adam Smith Institute or which uh, institute well, is that? Well, it's actually it's called the Smith Institute uh, the because Smith. it's named for two people named Smith. It's named for Adam Smith, and it's also named for Vernon Smith, who's one of my colleagues. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, he's great. And, well, yeah, so it's called the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy at Chapman University in Orange County, California. And it's great. I mean, I, this is, I'm about a year and a half uh, through a two year fellowship. If anybody wants to send me money to continue, please do. Uh, but, and it's a terrific group of people. We've got economists, we've got liber- literary scholars, we've got philosophers, we teach interdisciplinary discussion classes. Um, and it's just really a kind of ideal intellectual environment, uh, the kind that's very hard to find. All right. So parting shot, last, very last question for real. What are you working on? What, what are you excited about? Like, what's going on? What's going on? Well, right now, I'm gearing up to do some things for Works in Progress um, mm-hmm. uh, over, the, over the next year, including some more writing on synthetic biology. Um, I'm hoping to do something on... Uh, various ways we fasten clothes, everything from very ancient archaeological things to, you know, where does Velcro come from? Hope that'll work out. I'm, we're going to be working on a, um, a conference in the fall to celebrate the 250th uh, anniversary of the birth of Augustino Bassi, who, uh, if you've read the book, you know who he is, but is a pioneer of germ theory who's largely forgotten, and we want to make him less forgotten. So that's kind of what I'm working on now with them. I have some possible ideas for books in the works uh, as well, Mm -hmm. but I'm not ready to talk about them. All right. Um, it was great talking to you. And, you know, uh, you know, I think I've been reading you since like you were, you were in Forbes ASAP back in the day. Oh, yeah, I don't know yeah, if that's a thing yeah. anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. So it's, it's, it's been great talking to you. And um, yeah, everyone should check out all your books and I'll put the links on the show notes and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, thanks for you. Thanks for um, taking time out, Virginia. Great. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This podcast for kids.